How's the weather over there? Uh, it's honestly, it's not bad at all. <laughs> yeah. At least where I am, yeah. That's good. No, no tornadoes or even rain, so. Oh, wow. We got, we got rain up here. Yeah. So maybe it passed, passed over you guys. I think, yeah, I think it like split and just went right right on either side, top and bottom of Raleigh, and we were just fine. Awesome. It went right up to Virginia. Yeah, I have rain in Virginia. So. Oh, yeah. Do you have bad wind too? Not really, it's not that bad, okay. but I live in Northern Virginia, so maybe it just hasn't gotten here yet. That's where I'm at. I'm in Northern Virginia too. <laughs> Hey, Becca, this is Andre. How are you? Hey, Andre. Thanks for shipping my package, sending me the FedEx. Yeah, I'm glad they got it off to you. <laughs> can't wait to get it. <laughs> I can't wait to see your guys' research and, you know, the progress that's being made. That's exciting to me. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we'll give you an update. We have, we have lots going on, but... Yeah, I think you spurred us on, so that was good. That was good. You, you encouraged us. <laughs> anyway, I'll let, you, I'll let you give your talk. Yeah. I'm looking All forward right. to it. I think we'll. Uh, I think we'll get started. Uh, yeah, I think we'll get started. I think we have a decent amount of people in here. Um, not sure how many more people will show up in the next few minutes, but uh, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, we have a uh, pretty awesome speaker here today with us. Um, I know we've moved our schedule around a little bit, so all of our events are kind of out of order, but we uh, are having uh, Rebecca Spain with us today um, from the Hemp Foundation, and I'll let her uh, introduce herself, and then she's going to give us a, uh, a little talk, and then we'll have some discussion afterwards, and it should be good. It should be good fun, so uh, mm -hmm. I look forward to it. Let's get started. Yeah, thank you, Kobe, for having me here. And it's always refreshing to learn um, about these organizations and groups that you guys are doing, the efforts that you have. I heard a lot um, of what you guys are doing in sustainability. And it's really refreshing to see um, you guys are the next generation to make some big changes from, you know, previously what we've kind of, our environment has kind of gone downhill. So um, now is definitely a time to make that change. and. Um, to give you just a little bit of background about me, um, I'm originally from Hawaii, so I grew up in nature and surrounded by an ocean and spent a lot of my time on a macadamia nut field. So I have some experience as far as understanding what it means to create a livelihood through farming. And, um, and then I came to the mainland and got involved in a career and whatnot. My background is in fitness. And as a, as a coach and coaching people to get healthier and nutrition um, and just further along in my journey, I realized the connection more to us being healthy um, from everything to what we eat, to what we wear, and then how that translates to health of our earth as well. And how that is a cycle from our farming practices to what we're putting in our body towards the clothes that we're wearing. Um, so as an entrepreneur and a philanthropic entrepreneur, my brother and I had a foundation and we were using um, e-commerce. Um, we had a shop where we were selling goods. And initially we sourced a lot of our products um, from China and they weren't necessarily to what we valued, but it was an experience. Um, and what I mean by what we value is really truly knowing who you're buying from and what are you supporting and then knowing the materials that, um, are made out of that fabric. So I went on a search to look for, to source hemp products um, for our shop. And that's when I ran into the Hemp Foundation and I just um, really fell in love with their mission and what they're doing um, as far as helping impoverished farmers in the Himalayan area and cultivating, creating a value chain from, from these villages to restoring lands in that area because there was a mass migration out of that area where, you know, the breadwinners are looking for work in the cities 
and and then they're not home with their kids or with their wives. They come for brief visits to, you know, bring home the money, but the farms haven't been utilized and they've kind of been abandoned. So what we're doing at the Hemp Foundation is we're going into these villages and a lot of times it's a, a long trek and we're um, educating the farmers about the Himalayan hemp, which they're already familiar with, but there's been years where the plant has been um, grouped in with the psychoactive hemp plant and said, oh, we can't grow this anymore. So they have a rich history already of utilizing this plant for ropes and a lot of different things. And, and there's just been this huge gap where they haven't been able to do that. So uh, Vishal, our CEO at Hemp Foundation, he tells a story of when he went in to one of the villages and he saw um, that they were burning the hemp and he was like, no, 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 we'll buy that from you. And they were like, really? So they were so used to it being a persecuted plant that they would burn it whenever it would be, um, when it would grow. So that's kind of the mission. Um, there's a lot of things that we're, um, we're on a mission for. And one of them is helping the farmers, recultivating our land, regenerating the land, um, because hemp, as you might know, is um, such a great crop as far as um, helping to produce good soil. And then we can generate uh, four seasons of, of the fiber, um, which is much better than cotton. And it's not pesticide um, dependent. So, and it grows naturally. And then, so we provide the framework where we can create this value chain from the villages and then bringing it to Another place where we hire more workers to the process of degumming it, decorticating it, and then creating it into a fiber. And we have a lot of women also that are very skilled in um, embroidery work and hand work. So we do a lot of um, a lot of cool stuff with that, and then bringing it to the marketplace and um, so on. So I, I think um, I wanted to show. Can I do a share screen or? You I should mean, be able to, uh, you should be able to, I give you um, co-host permission, so. Oh, okay. I so, hope um, it works. I'm going to show you guys a cool video. It's only like two minutes long. And then, um, and then I'm going to walk you guys through a presentation that we created. It was really um, specifically for a presentation for the government in India, because we're trying to promote the farmers and there are still some litigations with the seed. Um, and then wanting to bring an industrial seed, but we're trying to advocate, hey, we've got something that's already growing there and it's natural to the environment. Why are we gonna introduce, you know, a foreign seed? Um, so this video first that I'm gonna share with you guys, um, it's pretty cool. It just show, gives you more of a picture to see some of the faces and in, in, in the village area. So I'm gonna hit share screen here. All right. Can you see? Yeah. Can you hear? जो भारत बहुत प्यारा होना चाहिए था बहुत विकसित होना चाहिए था आज ये हालत है हमारे देश काश हम अपने जीवन में कुछ कर पाए इन लोगों के लिए Thank you. 
So that's it. <laughs> Hope that kind of puts to life some of the things I was saying and seeing the people. It's pretty awesome. Um, I haven't yet gotten to go, but I'm looking forward to to it. And and we're definitely um, we're creating like an experience center too, so that more people can come and even see what we're doing down there and learn more. Um, so that's definitely an opportunity if you're interested in the future. Um, too. So moving on, I'm going to share with you the, um, was there any questions or anything so far? Can we stop if anybody has any questions? Yeah, feel free to just, uh, put up a hand or anything anytime if you want, if you have questions and comments as well. So. All right. Cool. It's kind of a chill, uh, Thursday. Little yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Overcast weather. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so I thought this would be kind of cool just to show you a little bit more about what we're doing. Um, and like I said, we created this to share with the politicians because we're doing a lot of things to help educate the people there and then to um, what we can do to get laws changed because there's still some like clause and stuff that make it a little bit more challenging. Um, for us to help the farmers get licensed and different things. Um, so who we are, I mean, we're a nonprofit. So we work, we have a regional office in Uttarakhan. I'm still trying to work on my pronunciation, <laughs> um, but it's right in the foothills of the Himalayan area. And like I said, like tra traveling to farm to farm, it's not like they're all close. It's windy roads, it's dangerous areas that we go into. And a lot of times it's traveling by foot in certain areas where you can't even drive through. So we're going to some pretty remote villages um, to talk to people and help them out. Um, and then we help to educate them. And we also provide um, different workshops on, on the skills. Um, so just some of the some of the little bit of facts too. Um, for one, the area is just awesome um, for cultivation and it's pretty much been barren for about seven years, which means that the land and the soil has kind of gotten some rest. And, and in that sense, it's just prime for further um, farmland. And there's a lot of barren areas. Um, when they go out because the farms have been abandoned and left. So one of the things that when we go and we educate and help to revive these villages, then in essence, we also do something for the land and bring more um, um, plants where it's been barren and, and conserve soil loss and help aid even in the water problems that we're having. Um, so again, we're just like educating um, the politicians mostly too about the need to be able to cultivate their own seed and not rely on other inputs. Um, so some things like why we were concerned because of the mass migration, which you saw in the video, um, and then to just to help um, lift the poor and the impoverished in that area. So here's kind of some issues and solutions. Um, what hemp cultivation can help prevent? And it's not, it's not like it's the miracle plant, but it definitely is um, a huge headway into solving a lot of our climate issues right now. Um, so one of the things is deforestation um, and groundwater issues. So the more that we can cultivate hemp in those barren lands, we can rejuvenate the soil. And, and hemp will grow a lot 
faster than if we plant trees. Um, so that's one of our missions is to um, revive those lands through planting hemp and then solving the mi mass migration problem, generating more jobs for people. Um, well, a big difference between um, like India and US, right, is that India has a huge, a much larger population than we do in US. Um, so, and, and they have a lot of people that are willing to work and work hard. So from the process of cultivating the hemp is a lot of hard work and we can employ a lot of people to do that process. Where in the US, we might have a lower population and we're looking more towards how can we make a factory to make that process go quicker, quicker with less manpower, right? Um, so in essence, we're creating jobs for a lot of people in need. Um, how we can fight plastic pollution. Um, we have a team of scientists right now where we're studying bioplastics um, and how can we help that in that area? Because you know we overconsume um, through just through water bottles. And I don't know about you, but I see trash all over. And I know there's some statistics too, as far as the microplastics in the um, ocean and how that's getting into our water and our health. And I know I just heard something in California right now um, where they're really um, looking, the science is looking deeper about how much plastic pollution is in, in the water and what can we do to remedify it. You know, that whatever that word I can't think of right now, <laughs> or I can't say. Um, and then pesticide use. So um, like I said before, the hemp doesn't require um, pesticides. Um, it doesn't require the use of pesticides, um, where cotton is heavily dependent upon it. And that's kind of our main industry right now. Um, so there's a, still a lot of headway to, to go for hemp. And there is a lot of like, we are promoting to try to go 100% in hemp. And we have a lot of textiles that are 100% hemp. But we also understand that it's a process and we can do blends too. So we've blended, um, we've actually blended hemp and wool, which is pretty cool. We made some beanies out of that. Um, but then we have some activewear where we're blending hemp with 50% hemp, 40% um, organic cotton and a, like a 10% spandex. So, um, you know, we're delivering something where people are kind of used to it, but let's go to more utilizing more hemp in our textiles because we know that it's better it has so many uses for um, reviving our planet and um, it's better for us. And then how we can use it also in the construction industry and hempcrete and hemp clay. Um, I just learned of a place actually near me in Virginia where they're refurbishing a amphitheater that was kind of like done for so long and they're gonna do it with um, hempcrete. So that's pretty cool. And the, the acoustics of hemp too is supposed to be really good. So they really need to see, and there's a lot more projects coming along even in the construction industry utilizing um, hemp. So here's our here's some of the um, strategies we have and the trainings that we're doing. Um, we do self-help groups where um, we help um, mostly teach the skills that are needed uh, for the women. And then um, we have marketplace training um, and we talk about crop quality and, and the industry. Um, so we're educating them on a lot of fronts, workshops for cultivation, where we're um, helping the farmers, um, giving them the know-how. We have about uh, 250 farmers that we've outreached to and that we're helping. Some of them, we're, we're helping them get uh, proper licensing and then um, giving them all the tools that they need. Um, we have grading workshops, grading the hemp seeds, um, for quality control, um, and then uh, the fiber degumming training, hemp yarn training, hemp apparel training. And so here you can kind of see our supply chain, right? We have the input from for the seeds and the equipment needed, the farmers, and then our testing, processing, transportation, um, drying and storing the plant, and then manufacturing it. So there's a lot that goes on in this phase too, um, where they have to separate, you know, the center to get the fibers out, um, and then there's a process of drying and then and then manufacturing it. 
putting it into a yarn that we can make fabrics and then we can make clothing, packaging it, um, and then retail and then consumer. We're, um, the Hemp Foundation, we're targeting um, a more of wholesale operations. So we're trying to help um, other eco friend conscious companies who are looking to supply hemp products um, in the marketplace and that they can get from us at a wholesale cost. But we also sell, do sell some on retail um, as well. This is just a little bit of the numbers to show the viability and potential growth of hemp. Um, it's a huge up and coming industry. And right now mostly uh, it says China and Europe generated an estimated 600 million in hemp fiber revenue. Over 600 million was exported to North America. Um, the biofibers, the, the market industry is growing there too. Um, being able to use it in, in plastics and, and just that the hemp is so much stronger, durable, has fire resistance, has so many great properties um, that can be used in so many different ways. So here you can see a little bit of what parts of the plant can be used for different things. So it's the part of the stock where we do the, the textiles and whatnot. And so at the Hemp Foundation, we are doing, um, we are, are getting into doing body care stuff. We have foods, we're doing paper and textiles. And then, like I said earlier, we're also um, have scientists and a team on bioplastics um, into the marketplace. So anything really that's, that's helping to fight plastic pollution and um, our, our use of paper and, and trees and going, going for hemp. <laughs> instead. Um, and this is just talking a little bit about the advantage that we that um, they do have in India as far as especially in the location um, and the traditional wisdom that they still have. Um, this is just a little case study. So you can see a cool picture where they um, they used to make these grass slippers made out of the um, hemp. Um, and they did that all with needle and hand and twisting the fibers, which is pretty cool. So it's like, how, how can we, we turn that into a modern day shoe, you know, too? How can we use hemp to, to make shoes? I know um, Dr. West is working on that too, so. <laughs> and so just a little bit about our team. Um, some of our achievements in this past year, I think we really, um, were successful, I guess, with COVID, we sold a lot, like over 100,000 hemp masks and brought that to the marketplace all across the world. And so we, we put a lot of all of that back into research and development. And we have about 250 or so products that we're um, putting out there and, and trying to market ultimately for a greater purpose to, to help these impoverished farmers and as well as to, um, help heal our earth, you know? Um, some more pictures. It's a really old, um, more authentic looming. Yeah, and that's it. I'd be glad to send this off if you guys are interested in um, seeing that. Yeah, for sure. We uh, we would love for you to send it to us and we can send it out to the rest of the club so that anybody who wants to look at that again, um, peer through it, can do that if they like. And um, Rebecca, you you uh, ready for some questions or discussion or anything? Sure. Okay. Well, I'll open the floor here for anyone who wants to ask some questions or um uh, has any comments about hemp or <clears throat> what hemp foundation is doing? Um, yeah, sure. There so is a ahead. comment from Noel. Um, I'll definitely um, send out that presentation so you can have it. Um, and yeah, so I'll put in the messages here, my email address. So if anybody wants to reach out, um, you can there. Um, yeah, I, I, we're, we're all into like, how can we connect 
for the greater good. <laughs> I really like your, <laughs> I think, I think when I was talking to doc, Dr. West, I was saying, I was saying something for the greater good. And he's like, oh, we have an organization, the greater good <laughs> textiles. Um, so, you know, the more that we can collaborate together, the greater good that we can do on our planet and, and being more mindful of all of the choices that we make and, and what are we buying and what is it supporting and what are we wearing and how has it been processed and how does that infect affect our environment and pollution and getting into our waterways like you know i think you guys are much more further along than i was probably at your age of thinking about those things and um and doing something about it um so awesome awesome to you guys like keep at it and please feel free to reach out to us even if you're in your own research um if you wanted to learn more we're open to sharing and um you know, it's all for the for the greater good. So I, I wanted to. Start, this is Andre West, Doctor West, to some of you. Um, I just want to say that we ordered some fabrics and some yarn recently from. So so Rebecca came to see us maybe a couple of couple of weeks ago, maybe two or three weeks ago, right? And Doctor Ron Ying, you may none of you may know who Doctor Ron Ying is, but Doctor Ron Ying is a new professor in TCS. Uh, he is a genius uh, at spinning, um, unbelievable. Uh, he's going to be teaching a class, I think, a graduate class coming up in the fall. Um, I know I'll be sitting in on it because I'm, my knowledge of spinning is 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 very vague. I, I think I took a class a hundred years ago or something. So uh, anyway, so um, he introduced me to uh, Rebecca and, and uh, showed me the website. And please go on the website too, all of you, because there you can order, uh, if you're designers, I'm sure there's some designers in this group, you can order the fabric. And I, was, I wasn't really worried about when it was gonna be shipped because, um, you know, it's one of these things, you know, you don't know when things are gonna be shipped, but Rebecca emailed me today and told me it's been FedEx today. So I only ordered it last week sometime. So that's really amazing too. I haven't seen a better quality hemp yarn than what she showed me. And so I'm really excited to to make a, a garment out of, out, of, out of the, so we ordered some yarn so we can knit the fabrics on our, our machines, but also to make some garments out of the hemp. Uh, just for some personal use, I'll be happy to do that. So um, go, yeah, go on the website because it has really, really beautiful uh, uh, yarn and fabrics that are, that are amazing. If anybody does want, you know, is scared about ordering something because uh, they haven't seen the tactile version of it yet, I'll have a couple of samples in my office, hopefully when Becca has theirs and uh, and come and they can get a snippet and see how, how beautiful it is. Now I'll, I'll, I have a couple of cones of yarn too, so. Um, one question for you, Becca. So obviously the world is now moving towards hemp production and that can be a little bit scary for the, for the, the native people that have been doing this for a long, long time. And that's, that's, that has, that's in the back of my mind too, you know, that we are, you know, we are trying to do some hemp production in the United States and, and, but firstly, I know that we're a long way away from that long way away producing the quality that you're producing um so you know is that is that a scary thought that you know that that western can can take over this business you know obviously it takes money and everything else is that a scary thought or how do you how do you approach that point of view i don't think that it's a scary thing i think if we just have this i think we're so far behind in the deficit that we all as a whole society internationally um have a lot of progress to be made and if we can um, do it together and not not and let go of these mindsets of competition but more of collaboration and um that's kind of how i see it and and what we're doing is trying to provide you know we're just trying to provide the products out there to help in these efforts um so we're not we're not really concerned about thinking about competition right now. And, you know, we're just keeping, keep evolving and improving on what we have so that we can continually offer the best, you know? 
<laughs> I mean, does that answer your question? I, I, yeah, yeah. I just, you know, I'm just a little bit concerned, but obviously the, 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 what, the, what you're making, the product you're making, I haven't seen by anybody else on the planet. So the idea is that um, they're making a, 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 you know, and everybody wants, wants to get to that. But at the same time, you know, it's better to be made out of hemp than it is to be made out of polyester. So if, if the whole world was made out of hemp, we'd be a lot better off, right? Yeah. <laughs> and we have a long way to go. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I, I'm Thank sure you. there's going to be a point where things are going to level off, you know, and then um, there's going to be a drop in the prices, which will probably be helpful. Um, and, and then it will become more sustain. Hopefully sustainable clothing will become more of a normal. Thank you. I had a question. Um, what does your like day to day and like what do you specifically do um, with the Hemp Foundation? Yeah, good question. Um, so I have my own Etsy shop for one. So I market a lot of their products on Etsy for my um, business as well. I have a brand called Reset and Restore. And it kind of falls in line with um, my initiatives for health. So I do have some superfoods on there as well, but then also um, hemp textiles is a big thing. So I'm all about how can we reset and restore our mind, our body, and then in turn reset and restore our earth. Um, so I have that Etsy shop. I'm also doing, um, I'm really big into marketing and stuff. So I'm, I'm doing um, like, I started an email campaign for them. So we can send out weekly emails to our clients. Um, and then I'm also um, the main contact in the US for all wholesale orders. So I'm dealing with clients in other companies like I've worked with a company in Colorado that's looking to put their brand on t-shirts. So we do a lot of custom work and stuff. So I, I talk um, with these clients and help bring the products and any customizations that they need um, to them. So I, that's, and then just helping a lot in the business um, sense and making decisions and what can we do next to help um, educate and promote hemp. That's cool. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for asking. Is it all right if I share a link to your Etsy shop on our recap email? Sure. Okay. Yeah. I really just found it. I found it to check. Thank you. <laughs> you guys find anything. It's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I'm actually in the process of loading a bunch. I don't, I only have a little bit of things on there and it takes a lot of time to work, to load new products. So um, in the next few days, uh, I'll have a whole bunch more stuff loaded on there. Um, yeah, within the next week or so. That's really cool. Um, what's like your favorite part of your job? It could be like one like small thing that happened one time or like just something you do every day, but what's your favorite part? Oh my gosh. I think my favorite part is just because I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I love to help other people succeed and I love ideas. I'm like an ideas person. So I love collaborating with other businesses and sharing ideas. Um, I guess specifically, like I, I get to have conversations with somebody who's looking for hemp protein powder and they're looking at, to market it. And I'm learning something along the way. Like um, just like what they're looking for in the product. I like the research. Um, I named a whole lot of things, <laughs> but I, I love what I do. And I, I, I feel like anything you should do, you should do it because you love it. I have a question. Um, my dad is very excited about hemp clothing. He's like very into it and he got a hemp shirt <laughs> like a few years ago and he was like super excited about it um is like a lot of your wardrobe hemp clothes are you like trying to switch over to like all hemp clothes or oh. do you, like, <laughs> your wardrobe balance with hemp yes so I am totally on a mission like I've been taking stuff out of my closet and taking it to goodwill because I want to live true to what I value and what I'm wearing right now is not and I'm moving on to getting I want to be at a place where my whole wardrobe is like hemp 
or like hemp blends, you know, cotton and stuff, um, or, but all sustainable. So I'm definitely on that um, journey myself to um, adapt that way <laughs> in my closet. Yeah. I have a what about question. You? I have a question too. <laughs> you have a question? No, I was just, I was just gonna um, ask that question back like for everybody else and their closets. And are, are you like 100% where you want to be sustainable or do you still have some of the old stuff that you're getting rid of? Like, how do you, how do you do that? Well, I think for my closet, like making sure that when I'm getting rid of stuff, making sure that it's actually going to someone else and that it's actually getting used well and not just ending up in landfill is something that's super important to me. So I don't buy any new clothes that aren't sustainable. Like I don't buy any fast fashion or anything. Um, so I'll get secondhand or sustainable, but yeah, I am trying to get some stuff out of my closet that I don't really want anymore, but just finding the best place for that to go. Is yeah. the challenge. And I, I think like we have to have a different mindset too. And being in the U S we've been cultured to have a consumerism mindset. And I'm also looking at how I can have less, but more quality and meaningful, um, stuff. So I don't, I realized I don't need as much clothes as I had had in the past <laughs> and just simple, but stuff that I always feel good about wearing. That's some good advice right there. That's, that's, uh, at least in, in my closet, that's what I try to try to do. I like to have only a few things. I don't have a very expansive closet, but the things I have are all high quality and they'll last me a long time. And if I, if they're at, some of my things aren't as like, you know, sustainability oriented as I would like, but I don't, um, I used to be big and just like bringing stuff to Goodwill and dropping it off. But now since everything I have is something that's like of high quality, um, and will last a while, I resell it to other people or give it to a friend that I know is going to use it and wear it. So, um, that's been how I have been making my transition and I uh, use the money from that to switch to something that is um, of same quality, but also um, more sustainable. And everything I buy is basically material driven. So I don't, uh, I don't love to like follow trends and stuff. Most of what I, I like to buy is if, if it's made with a material that I know about and that I have an interest in it, I'll be like, ah, oh, I would like uh I would like to to wear that so that's my answer to that question i like that anybody else want to share on that um i'm definitely becoming because of this like way more aware of what my clothes are made of um but i would say like a lot of um, like the clothes that I have that I've had for a while and I kind of like to like revamp them every once in a while, um, kind of like take them apart and sew them back together in a different way. Um, but what I actually wanted to comment on was just something um, that I was thinking about like while we were talking is I'm in a sorority and um, you know, every like every semester we have like a certain amount of events um, and like at almost every event, like they make a t-shirt for it. Um, and like, you don't have to get a t-shirt for everything, but there are some events where you do need to get a t-shirt because you have to wear it to that event. And it's just something that I always think about, like, and we're not the only sorority that does that. And we're definitely not like a sorority that, like we don't require it as much as other sororities do. So it's just interesting to think, or like, it's something that I keep in mind a lot, like, how much cotton must be going into that just I mean and just for NC State for however many sororities we have to get you know maybe four or five t-shirts per semester per sister it's just something to think about I don't know maybe it'd be better if we started using hemp blends for our t-shirts good point yeah. yeah thanks for sharing that Noel that's very that's a great point 
and just for like events for other things i feel like the what they always give you is a t-shirt and that kind of breeds the the sense that t-shirts are a quick and easy thing to make and dispose of which is not not a good mindset to be fostering um i have a question not related to this i was wondering about how you're saying that the hemp uh, growing in the Himalayas is illegal, right? They're not, is, how, how illegal is it? And how are you uh, sourcing that if it's illegal in that area to grow it? Um, yeah. Is there like a license uh, thing um, involved or how does that work? I'm not clear on the specific details but I think in that presentation it, what that I'll send you I think it gives you a little bit more details as far as that um but yeah we're kind of like working a, around <laughs> around the current issues which we shouldn't be so we're trying to get it changed so that the Himalayan hemp is 100% accepted you know because there's like they want to make sure that it's tested for industrial and there's big organizations, you know, that have come in in the past, even into India and introduced a seed and said, oh, you need to use this seed, you know? And so on, on the presentation too, you can see like the case, a little case study too. I don't know if you remember what the cow, but it's just an example of when we bring in something that's not native or maybe even the best for that land, then things happen <laughs> that aren't necessarily good. So looking at anywhere that you're growing or we want to we want to use something that's the, that natural seed to that environment and um i think the guilty parties are the big companies who want to put a profit on a seed and and say we have this strain that is pest resistant is this and that so let's create parameters to say that you need to buy this seed from us and then it causes strain on the farmers because they have to pay more money for this input seed that they're told this is the seed we need to use. Um, so it causes a whole lot of issues. But I think I answered your question maybe a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was great. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a question on like the top of your website, it lists um, like the US, the UK, India, and Australia. So you guys looking to expand growing into some of those regions or is that more of where you have like outreach teams and um, development or? We're, we have customers in those areas. So we have phone numbers to make it easier for them to reach those places. And we're definitely looking to expand. So U.S. is the kind of the largest market probably, I would say. U.K. is getting a lot of our stuff too. Um, actually all over the world, but um you know, it can, it can do really well here, especially since we don't really, we have to import it in some ways. We don't have the infrastructure yet completely for it. Um, but a lot of that is changing too. So yeah. did I answer your question? Yeah, thank you. I don't know if you said this in the presentation and I missed it, um, but is, are your products also are they manufactured like near where the hemp is grown or like where do you manufacture? Um, no, it's still pretty far. We bring it to Delhi. So if you look at a map, um, you'll see like Uttarakhand is on the foothills of the Himalayan area. And then Delhi is, I can't remember how long the drive is. I want to say maybe a 12 hour drive from there. So we have a regional office um, closer to where we get the farm. It's pretty a big process getting the the farm the um the material to one location and then to another location and then bringing it to delhi we have more of our where we have more of our manufacturing and stuff yeah um could you talk a little bit about the possibilities of having um biodegradable products from hemp Well, because it comes from the earth, then it can go back to the earth easy. 
<laughs> and we don't do um, too much other processing. We're in our processing. We are trying to do everything as natural as possible and even using less water and then using solvents that are non-toxic when we need to. Um, so are the products now, are they biodegradable or is that something you're kind of striving towards? Yeah, they are. Hemp is naturally cool. biodegradable. Cool, cool. All right. Yeah. On that note, what um, what kind of dyeing do you do you do, and what kind of dyes do you use? Is that also yeah. part of the ethos there? You try and use natural natural dyes, or how, how are you going about that? Yeah, I mean we we have um, azo free dye, um, and then we have more natural dyes. Of course, the natural dyes are more expensive. They're not something that. Um, a lot of people will go for the azo dyes, azo free dyes. Um, but I don't really, maybe you can tell me more. I don't really know the specifics of the makeup of the dyes. Do you, do you know? <laughs> I mean, it depends on the dye. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It depends on what you but use. I, but, that's, uh, so that's all I know on a general term is that mm -hmm. we do have accessibility to, to dye with more of a natural dye. And then we have the azo free dye. Okay. And do you, because uh, I know that in India, there's a big um, knowledge, traditional knowledge base for natural dyeing. I know a lot of, not a lot, but there are some small like apparel uh, studios that like work with um, people in villages in India that have a, like extensive natural dye knowledge. Is that um, a community that you're aware of and that you guys tap into or is that not, not part of the... I don't know videos. yet. Um, maybe um, some of the team who's been in there, they might know a little bit more, but I, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but I would say definitely because our, our mission is to do everything as, as um, clean as possible, you know, um, as environmentally friendly as possible. So anytime we have that opportunity, we're going to do that. And also with the understanding that it's a process and we're all moving towards that process and improving, you know, we want to go hundred percent hemp, but there's a way um, to get people adapted and used to getting to that point. For sure, for sure. Um, uh, one of my other questions is about uh, your wholesale business. Mm -hmm. Are there a lot of companies that, what, how many companies buy your wholesale material and what is the ratio between your retailing and your and your wholesale that you? We're provide? primarily focused on wholesale. Okay. Um, I think in the beginning, because we're a new company as well, so we're just trying to get the brand out. Um, so we did have on our site we had uh, some of the things on retail that people could buy, but it's it's more expensive because it costs a lot for shipping. So it doesn't really make sense for people to buy retail there. It's better for them to buy retail here from somebody who bought it in wholesale, <laughs> you know, and, and you don't have to worry about that shipping costs. Do you, who in the United States provides uh, retail products made from things that they bought wholesale from you guys? Do you have any specific uh, names or places? Um, Reset and restore on my shop. <laughs> no. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> no, um, I I'm dealing with a lot of different um, clients right now. So, like for one example, is I have a guy in Colorado that has a t-shirt business, and um, yeah, and he's he he's looking to do more sustainable type of clothing, and he's got like more organic cotton, different stuff. But he wanted he knows the value of hemp, so he wants to have more hemp products. Um, I had a person in California who's looking, a lot of CBD businesses bought um, our hemp masks this past year, a lot of CBD businesses, um, because they could resell it, you know, and it was cool. Um, it's got like the little hemp logo, so a lot of people like, I think I have a, our mask. And then we, we have some um, really cool embroidered ones too. I don't know if I have one right near me, but the ladies made, it's like intricately 
um, embroidered work on it and stuff. Oh, you can see on the um, Etsy shop link. There's yeah. some of the embroidered ones up there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. I have a flower shop that was looking for fabric for their flowers, like, you know, wrapping it around and using something more sustainable. So, so it's mostly like smaller uh, local businesses and stuff that are. Yeah, smaller businesses. Um, I'm dealing with one, one guy that's actually researching our hemp protein powder, but they have a massive market. Um, they're like suppliers of ingredients for products. Um, yeah, I think clothing and the masks were just the, is the big thing um, in the US that people are buying. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have any uh, questions or comments? I have uh, one more. I'll sneak in before you go again, Kobe. Okay, go ahead, Max. Um, what are, well, first of all, I guess, how big is the Hemp Foundation right now? Um, like how much hemp do y'all produce? I guess, monthly. Um, and also, what are your goals, uh, short term and long term for the Hemp Foundation? I don't know. Well, I don't know how much we're producing right now. Um, um, but as far as goals, um, I think kind of what I alluded to before is, for one is, the, one of the biggest goals is educating, um, getting education out there. If you go to our website, You'll see lots of blogs just educating people on, on the uses of hemp, on how it can help um, fight deforestation, plastic pollution, a lot of different things. Um, so our long-term goals, too, is just to increase um, everything that we produce towards hemp and um, the bioplastics. I think that's a big thing. And then even the hemp creep. And then the more... And then as we progress, getting more farmers involved, helping more people. And, um, and that, I think that will two and two come together, right? The more that we have to produce and the more products we have to the population, the more, we, the more that we can help farmers and we can cultivate the land and um, get the soil healthier from where it was barren from the, um, from the abandoned villages and different things. Yeah. That's kind of, kind of part of my question I was going to ask as well. I was going to ask if you know how many farm, farm farmers you work with or you've been able to like yeah. bring a part of your mission and what their reception to you is when you come and educate them about hemp. Like if they're really receptive to it or if that's, if that's like kind of a difficult task to, to, to educate them on all that and get them involved. I think most people are very happy because they're in a place where they, um, there's not that much hope. You know, the animals are destroying the land and they don't have any crops to, to have a livelihood. So when we go on in there, they're very receptive and we're showing them what we can do and they're on board and they're happy. Like they're, you know, for someone to be able to work and, and do something to make a living and help their family and bring their family back home that have been going out of the villages, that just brings them joy, you know, especially for the older generation to know, oh, the younger people can come back and we can work the land again and we can rebuild th these areas, you know? So um, it's good. It, the reception is very, very good. <laughs> and we help over um, 250 farmers and we're increasing in our campaign. So, um, Vishal and the team have been going into villages. They take trips for a month or so at a time and go and talk to people on the ground at a grassroots level. Awesome. Thank you. Does anyone have any last minute, minute questions? Because um, we should probably wrap up soon. It's 726. So get any last minute questions or comments in there. Um, and then we'll say goodbye to our wonderful guest speaker and we can wrap up for the day.
I'll just say thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you guys and thank you for sharing and for the questions. Um, it's awesome to see. Awesome. Thank you for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Nobody has anything else they want to want to add or ask? I want to say thank you too. I really <laughs> enjoyed this presentation. Awesome. Thank you, Rebecca. You're welcome. Yeah, you guys have my email too. So if you um, think of anything after, feel free to send me an email if you have any questions or anything. Yeah, and check out their website. Um, and if, if any of you have little clothing projects that you're doing, definitely think about uh, buying some of their stuff for that, like Dr. West said. I think that would be really cool. Um, and it'd be best to contact me probably directly. Um, you can go to the site too, but as far as um, to help save on costs, because I'm going to be having some things probably in stock here, costs on shipping and stuff okay, as we cool. grow. So. Awesome. Yeah, well then do that. Yeah. Keep Rebecca's uh, email in your address book and, and reach out to her. All right. Sounds well, good. I think... Yeah, I think that's all. I think we'll wrap it up here. Um, Rebecca, you can roll out whenever you want. I have one thing I'm going to show to the club really quick. Just um, it's, it has nothing to do with hemp or anything. It's about uh, Earth Month at NC State. So don't feel like you need to uh, stick around for this. Um, feel free to, to go ahead and get to your, your, your day. Um, but we really appreciate you having, uh, yeah. we really appreciate you being here with us. And um, yeah, we hope to uh, hear from you soon. And, and awesome. we'll definitely, I hope some students reach out to you uh, with some, with some inquiries. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Um, just really quick before everyone rolls out, uh, Claire wanted me to share this with you. Can everyone see this screenshot from her phone? <laughs> okay, so um, this is uh, about April, which is coming up, the month of April, um, which is Earth Month at NC State. And these are some little bullets about how to participate in Earth Month. Um, and this is about um, event planning. So. Whoever's on Fashion Revolution Week, I think this is a great, this is usually, I mean, Earth Month is when we do Fashion Revolution Week stuff just because Fashion Revolution Week also happens in April. So um, these are some good bullets to keep in mind. And uh, I would love to hear uh, via email or right now, if anyone has time and is on the Fashion Revolution Week committee, what some ideas are and see if we can, um, uh, plan out some stuff in the next couple of weeks to do during Earth Month. Um, one of the things here is plan your event during uh, the month of April. And if we submit our plans before the 26th, which I, I don't know if we will, but uh, we can if, if we have anything planned. Um, and then uh, they will, basically they'll promote our events. Uh, if we submit to the to the sustainability um, department uh, before the 26th of March, and uh, I think that'd be really great. So, if anyone has uh, any ideas from Fashion Revolution Week, um, I would promote the Sustainable Business Forum for this, but we haven't finalized any plans for that yet. So, um, and I'm going to meet with someone from another club tomorrow to see if they want to partner with us for that. So. I don't know if we'll be able to submit any plans for that before the 26th, but if uh, Fashion Revolution Week has any ideas, which I know that there are some awesome ideas in that committee because we talked about that last time, um, just shoot me an email or I can stay on here a couple extra minutes and we can talk about that if you want. But uh, other than that, that's, uh, that's all. Feel free to roll out and uh, I appreciate everyone coming in here. Kobe, can I just make my announcement that I... That I yeah. Shamefully missed for, for the two last meetings. I'm sorry, but life gets in the way sometimes. That's you know, okay. You know how that works. Um, yeah. Regis Bradley, which is a lady named Beth Hoffer, 
has reached out to us. I'm on the board of We Just Rally. We've been sitting on our hands for a year because of everything going on, but they are all arms wide open to, to work with you guys. Um, so if anybody on you, it doesn't have to be official, can be unofficial in any other way, they're gonna, we're going to, you know, We Just Rally, if you don't know, just look up We Just Rally Instagram. It, um, you know, it's, it's, an, it's been a lovely organization. I've known it. I've been at NC State now eight years now, and it's, and it's been one of the only organizations that has, a, that has done, you know, really, really quality events, I think, over, over the period of time. You know, we're trying to get back to, to reality and, you know, we need, they're going to need some support. And I know there's a lot of students that have supported in the past, but if someone wants to be a connecting rod between Greater Good and, and uh, Redress, uh, Beth is, will, is willing to speak. Don't have to go through me. You can go directly to Beth and, and work with her with the group. So if you just send me, if you send anybody sends me an email, I'll just forward it on to Beth and, you know, I'll just be involved in the, in the board meeting decision, but nothing else. And, and that I think will be really good for the club because eventually they're going to do you know some really nice things, and it'd be nice if the collaboration would be there. The other, the only other thing I have to say is Eric Henry, which maybe a lot of you know, uh, is now making a hemp T-shirt. So um, hopefully we'll be able to get some hemp T-shirts, and we just got a printer in the dyeing and finishing lab. So hopefully we'll be able to make some um, printed hemp shirts. That'd be a really nice thing to do. So maybe we can. We can make an upgrade on the Greater Good shirt and make it a hemp shirt eventually. But we'll, we'll, give me a couple of months to figure that one out, though. All right. <laughs> All right. That would be awesome. That would that would be super cool. Okay. Yeah. When you guys figure that out. But yeah. Uh, please, if anyone, I think it would be a really cool opportunity for any uh, student to be that connect that connection between us and uh, Regis Raleigh. We've done stuff with them in the past. Um, I would do it if I wasn't graduating, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, any freshman, sophomore, junior, if you, um, I think it would be a really great, um, opportunity just to be connected with Redress Raleigh on that level and help connect greater good with them and, um, help us, um, support them with some events and stuff and kind of bring more attention to greater good. So if anyone's interested in that, um, we haven't gotten any responses yet from, when we first asked that, but please uh, definitely consider it um, because it would be a really great opportunity for this club. I would love to see us continue on our momentum here, making this club better and better each year um, as after I leave. So I would love to see that that happen. So please uh, don't be afraid to just send me an email or send Dr. West an email and he will just send it straight to Beth um, or however you want to do that. So. Uh, thank you, Dr. West, for sharing that and bringing that, bringing that uh, back to light for us. No problem. Hey, for this Redress Raleigh rep, I'm going to have to be living in Raleigh right now for it. No, no. Um, you know, like everybody else, we've been doing virtual for the last year. So, um, you know, the events are based, you know, when they get events, they are based around Raleigh. But, you know, that's that's they're few and far between. So I don't think you have to be a resident of Raleigh to be part of Regis Raleigh. Yeah. And Max, you'll, I'm assuming you'll come back to Raleigh for next year when school is hopefully back in person. So I think this will definitely be something that will not just be for right now, but continue on if I'm correct, Dr. West. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It can, it'll be continuous. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. So think about that. Um, uh, you will be hopefully will everything will be in person next semester and from here on out who knows what when the next pandemic will strike but uh yeah i think it'll be, it'll be a cool thing to um, establish uh now and then have it for for the future and if uh no one has any does anyone else have any questions or anything they would act, like to talk about before we officially end it for today well, I'd like to stay on and talk to you about Fashion Revolution Week, but. Okay, perfect. Anyone else? If not, feel free to, to roll on out. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming. See you, Kobe. See you, Max.